Welcome and welcome back everybody to the OK Grognard Show. Today is Monday, June 13th, 2022, 10 a.m. Central in beautiful Lake Geneva, Wisconsin. And we are continuing with our series on the first edition Advanced Dungeons and Dragons Dungeon Master's Guide Magic Items section. This is part six. We were barely scratching the surface as I get into the descriptions for scrolls today and this is in part why i uh, shied away from doing this section because it's such a huge section i mean i could have done it piecemeal just do scrolls for one show just do potions from one scrolls and in essence that's what this more or less turns out to be but i wanted to tackle it all and just work my way through it as a whole series and it was a good, uh, it's a really interesting section. There's so much to it, and a lot of people love magic items, so there you go. I should also say, still getting the studio together over here. Uh, this is something that's an ongoing project that probably won't come to fruition until after the hiatus, which is the month of July. So we'll be doing this show one one more next week on magic items in uh, part seven we'll continue it after the hiatus uh, we will do one show after part seven that'll be a first half of 2022 wrap up along with some other interesting things stuff about the nexus game fair show that will have taken place the previous weekend and some uh, discussion of a new campaign all I've just started up, I'll just be starting up the very next day, actually. Right? Is that right? No. I'll be starting that up a week from tomorrow. So I'll recap my first session and talk about what I'm doing. It'll be a first edition game. It will include uh, mostly people I've played with before, but not necessarily... Um, not necessarily role-playing games. Some were people I board-gamed with. And, uh, yeah, no, I actually played in RPGs with, too, at conventions. And some from the uh, last fall. Let's see, I think there's two from last fall. There's one from the campaign that happened that got uh, snuffed out by COVID. Um... Yeah, we'll talk about that then. For today, we're going to be talking about scrolls. We've got two more shows after this before the July break. And after that, we'll be back on August 1st, continuing, I think, uh, well, we'll have a kind of a beginning of the second half show and make some discussion about that and any changes to the show and formatting and whatnot. And then the week after that. The 8th of August, I think we'll be getting back to the Magic Items series and do part 8. So, here we go. It's DMG. It's, uh, there's a lot to it, so let's dive in. Scrolls. Scrolls will generally be found in cylinders. Tubes of ivory, jade, leather, metal, or wood. You may require that players read certain magic runes, slash writings inscribed on tombs in order to open the container in some cases. This enables you to have read magic or comprehend languages, spells taken and used, as well as giving the possibility for traps, symbols, explosive runes, and curses along with a powerful scroll. Each scroll is written in its own magical cipher, so to understand what sort of scroll has been found, the ability to read magic must be available. Once a scroll is read, to determine its contents, a read magic will not be needed at a uh, will not be needed at a subsequent time to invoke the magic. Note that even a map will appear magical until the proper spell is used. Reading a scroll to find its contents does not invoke its magic unless it is a 
specially triggered curse. The latter scroll appears to be a scroll of any sort. It radiates no evil or special aura beyond the magical. That's curses for you. Scrolls not read to determine contents immediately are from 5 to 30% likely to fade. It is your option to set the percentage or use or use a D6 to randomly determine it for each scroll. Uh, let's unpack some of that before we get into examining the scrolls. Um, the cylinders thing is great. Uh, if you have a source for scrolls in a campaign, often, often players in campaigns I run attach themselves to a temple for the... Uh, and maybe have a uh, magic user mentor because you know if there's a magic user in the group where do they learn initially where do they apprentice they must know somebody it doesn't mean it has to be somebody in the area anymore but i often find at least through the first few levels that's a useful thing somebody they can go back to can't be bothered to go on adventures if asked to uh, that would be crazy. I have important things to do. You go do what you've got to do, but be careful. I spent a lot of time helping you come along, and I'd like to know that that is, has been worthwhile. But you got to find your way. Anyway, it's good to uh, have those kinds of uh, resources available, not to exploit but at least to tap into for information, maybe. Also, uh, it doesn't hurt to uh, have somebody like that available for some healing at a price, always. Things always cost. There are material components to be concerned with, and you're taking these people away from their other endeavors, so time is money. Anyway, um, the whole idea of cylinders, tubes of ivory, jade, leather, metal, or wood, is good when you find something uh, because they were probably protected. I mean, maybe somebody died, maybe somebody dropped something like this. Maybe it's being stored away, but in any event, you've got to know that uh, those things need to have been protected at some point. Wow, this guy looks like, oh, sorry, we got a little, uh, a little chatter. And it appears to be hmm. let's report this person. Sorry, we got a spammer in the chat. We gotta take care of that real quick. Uh spam is spam is spam. And then we've got to block them. Oop. There we go. Anyway, the uh the idea that they would have to be protected only makes sense, right? And then can we delete it? Uh, ban them from the channel, too. There we go. All right. Uh, they would have ne needed to be protected at some point. Um, whether somebody would go so far as to put some dangerous runes on... A low-level magical scroll uh, seems a little ridiculous, but certainly for higher-level things, things that uh, only their eyes, for their eyes only sorts of things, you'd want to include some sort of protection. So some runes or perhaps, uh, perhaps something on the order of uh, a minor curse or something that just makes it tougher to open. I like guess some sort of a locking uh, magic would be a good thing. Um, but again, lower level things, I don't think you need it for those sort of sort of uh, scrolls and spells. Each scroll is written in its own magical cipher. Uh, you got to have that read magic for sure. And this idea that a map will appear magical... I don't think it needs to appear magical. Uh, a map can just be a map. If it's in a tube, it can look like a scroll at a glance. 
until you open it up and look at it and discover it's a map. Why complicate it with uh, sub subterfuge that uh, ultimately just confuses the uh, the game and the world for the sake of a an annoyance? I, I don't see that as being worthwhile, unless again. Uh, this map is to some high-level treasure, and it's been protected by somebody who had it. And they had some spells on it. So those would probably appear, appear magical because there's something cast upon it already, some runes or something to make it invisible to the eye or moon letters like they do in, uh, in The Hobbit, right? Something can only be read at a certain time of year or under a certain kind of light. Stuff like that's kind of neat, and that could be magical for sure. Um, reading a scroll to find its contents is not a book, it's magic. That's right. Once you once you know what a scroll is, you can look at it, and it's not automatically cast. Uh, scrolls do not determine... Uh, scrolls not read. This is kind of a tough one, right? Scrolls not read to determine the contents immediately are from 5 to 30% chance likely to fade. That's like a uh, pulling the rug out there, right? I mean, what's the point of having a scroll that's going to fade so easily? I would think that you could do something like that as a protection. Say, if a high-level uh, magic user wanted to research a spell that would make a scroll fade after being looked at, if not used within a certain period of time, um, that might be a cautionary thing. He knows, she knows, that uh, the scroll contains a certain spell, and that magic user is not going to look at it until it's necessary to use it, and so might do the other to kind of uh, frustrate a uh, magic user who has uh, illicitly come across this scroll. So those are all things worth uh, worth noting. So let's move on. When scrolls are examined, the following table can be used to find their nature. 70% magic users, 30% cleric, um, second roll, like a 10% uh, illusionist if it's a magic user scroll, and a 25% druidic if it's a clerical scroll. Only the indicated class of character can use the scroll except thieves. Thieves have a chance at higher levels of being able to use scrolls. Protection scrolls can be read by any class or race of character, even without a magic spell. So those are just, oh, creator, help me in this time of need, save me from undead. So those are just, anybody can use them and... Uh, Read them and use them, and that's always a good thing, right? Spell level of scroll spells. All scroll spells are assumed to be written so as to make it easy and quick as possible for the writer. It wouldn't be very good if every time you needed to use a spell on a scroll, you had to devote a whole day to something, right? Thus, the level of the spell, its characteristics with respect to range, duration, area, effect, etc., where a level is a factor, is typically but one level higher than that required to actually use the spell. See, I always use minimum level to make the scroll, or minimum level to cast the spell, so I guess one level higher would be a little better but never below 6th level of experience. Thus, a 6th level magic user spell is written at 13th level of ability, a 7th at 15th, etc. A scroll fireball or lightning bolt spell is of 6 dice, 66 in most cases, but as DM, you may decide to make certain scrolls scroll spells more powerful by increasing the level at which they are written. However, this will certainly affect the chance of spell failure as given below. Here's the tricky part, as they say. Magic spell failure. 
from a scroll, I think mainly, but this is general, right? If a spell user acquires a scroll with a spell of a level not yet usable by the character, the spell user may still attempt to use the spell. The chance of failure or other bad effects is 5% per level difference between the character's present level and the level of magic use at which the spell could be used. For example, first level magic user finds a scroll with a wish spell inscribed on it. This is an extreme example upon it. The chance of failure is 85% as wish is a spell of 9th level magic attained at 18th level of magic use. 18 minus 1 is 17 times 5%, 85%. Dice are rolled and the score of 85 or less indicates failure of some sort and the following table is consulted. Level difference, 1 to 3, 95% total failure. Uh, boy, that seems counterintuitive. 95% total failure, 5% reverse or harmful effect. So the worse off it is, the more likely it is to get to have a harmful effect that is the gist of that so harmful effect well that can be a lot of different things and sometimes you'll have to decide that maybe just a uh, itchy burning sensation in the nether regions for a week which is distracting and makes concentrating on certain spells hard, if not impossible, to do. Weird little things can... Uh, but, you know, if you relate it to the scroll, the spell that is on the scroll, the one trying to be used, it might make a little more of a flavorful. So, yeah. If a fireball fail, somebody tries to cast a fireball and they can't, it fails and it becomes harmful. Sure, something like uh, all their clothes burn off and they're just standing there. So, you know, it doesn't have to be deadly. It could do some damage. It doesn't have to be immediate death or anything like that, but make it fun. Make, uh, make failures humorous because uh, they'll be more memorable for one. Uh, if they're tied to the spell, oh, you're going to cast a lightning bolt? Remember what happened with Fireball? You better get out from under that tree. <laughs> Use of scroll spells. When a given scroll is read for purposes of copying the spell's formula so as to be able to know it or to release its magic, the writing completely and permanently disappears from the scroll. The magic content of the spell is bound up in the writing and use releases and erases it. Thus, reading a spell from a scroll of seven spells makes the thing a scroll of six spells. So then erase the entire thing if you pluck one from it to put in your spell book. No matter what a player may attempt, a scroll spell is usable but once and only once. No exception should be made, save in the case where you have a special magic item in mind. Perhaps a scroll which can be read from once per week or whatever, and always, only in rare finds. So yeah, it's pretty straightforward. You want to copy it, it takes it off the scroll, it doesn't take all anything other on the, that's on the scroll away. Um and usable but once. Note regarding the use of scroll spells. Those characters able to read and employ scroll spells may do so regardless of other restrictions. And once the spell is known, it is not necessary to use a special read magic in order to affect its powers. Reading of such scrolls is possible even to magic users who are otherwise unable to employ such a spell for any reason whatsoever, be it inability to learn 
or above level of use, although in the latter case there is a chance of spell failure. Ability to use scroll spells does not permit a cleric to use a druid spell, a magic user spell, or a magic user to use a cleric spell. Likewise, it does not extend the ability of spell use to non-spell using characters, except for, with respect to protection scrolls. Spell level range. This gives the parameters for random determination of spell level for those scrolls you do not set beforehand. When spell level is determined, it is a simple matter of randomly f to randomly find which particular spell which particular spell it is by consulting the appropriate spell tables from the player's handbook. So that's all pretty clear. Uh, I am not going to dive into protection scrolls. We'll get into the rest of the scrolls next week and uh, leave this at that because that's a pretty good chunk already and I'd like to have these a little shorter videos going forward so we might as well get used to it today. I hate to ramble. I hate to make them too long. Sometimes it's fun, but Sometimes uh, it can be a deterrent to taking the time to view it. In any event, let's say this. Remember, next week, more magic item stuff, part seven. The week after that, the first half of the year wrap-up for the OK Grognard show. Then we're on summer hiatus through the month of July and back on August 1st with a uh, introduction to the second half of the year. And then August 8th, we'll be back to part 8 of the magic items. Hopefully, we'll wrap up the scrolls next week, and then we can move on. I think rings is the section after that. So that'll be fun and a good way to start the second half of the year in August. Thank you very much for joining us today. I do appreciate it. And let's just say... This has been the uh, first edition of Ants Dungeons & Dragons Dungeon Master's Guide Magic Items Part 6. We'll get on with it next week. Also, the show streams live on Twitch each Monday at 10 a.m. Central and is then archived on YouTube. If you want to join us on Twitch, please do and subscribe to the channel or follow the channel. And if you catch up with it on YouTube, there's you should subscribe. Click the little bell to make sure you are updated whenever a new video is uploaded. We'd also appreciate if you give a thumbs up to any videos you like and enjoy. And feel free to comment on the material. Jump into the conversation. That should be fun as well. Thanks to our Patreon supporters. Links are provided in the show notes. Tom Tullis of Fat Dragon Games. Rick Hershey of Fat Goblin Games. Carlos Lysing of Castle Entertainment. Heath Farnden of the NTPD and D20. Dave O'Brien of Four Quacks Games. And Shane Bradley, DM extraordinaire. This has been the OK Grognard Show from beautiful Lake Geneva, Wisconsin. Bye-bye.